uh, November 21st, 2021. And this was the title of the prophecy. Now, I've never gotten a title of the prophecy before, and I wondered what that was about. Why, why would I have a title of a prophecy? And then it'll explain itself on down. This is what it said. Behold, the judge comes. We are in a time and an era like the horse secretariat, where champions will be remembered for all time. A time when warriors get up in the morning and suit up for war, for battle. In this time, the country's leaders have failed the people. The Republican Party, that many hold so dear to right the country and hold it to it and hold it to its moral values, have failed us. They, as a whole, have allowed a jackal that everyone knows is not and never will be the president of the United States to sit in its most honored seat. He has been allowed to lower the standard of the greatest nation alongside Israel, to be lowered to the lowest place ever seen. Never has there been such a low state and moral value as now. God has brought his prophets on the scene to speak his word and his will. Be damned anyone who seeks to thwart it. Rise up in the spirit. Rise up in the spirit, O oh, you warriors. Rise up in the spirit. Rise up and fight in the spirit. Rise up, rise up, O oh, ye warriors. Rise up in the spirit. Rise up and fight. Then I heard the name McConnell. I heard the name Graham. This is the way it read. McConnell, Graham, names of traitors to freedom, sellouts to a way of life that only could have been born within the dark regions of demented minds, masqueraded as freedom, a painted face deliberately done. Afraid of riots, afraid of violence, these have turned to run, for they know they are on their way out. So be damned those that follow. Oh, but you forget the great I am. You mocked religion and you pretended it's not real, but what you will see now is a slide from the hill. For I am emerging a new party from the red, new life, if you will, a raising from the dead. Revival in the youth, revival I have planned, and a handful of people will rise up in the party of the red to save the land. Though the old leaders did not have the courage to throw them out, I lack none at all says the Lord. And with a blast of my nostrils, oh, how the mighty fall. Can you stand to hear the sound? Can you stand to hear the roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah as he steps through the open door? The answer is no. And it remains no until now. So, oh, ye feeble and worried over your nation, Look to me, says the Lord, and wipe your worried brow, for I am walking now. Hear me coming down the path. Hear the cheers and the sound of joy. Oh, my God, he's here at last. Then I heard the name, and that was given to me on, well, all of this was, on 11. Yes. Now, listen to this. I heard the name, I heard this, Rotterdam, England, 
Holland, I see. I saw Holland. I heard some nations are crying, oh me. I heard Rotterdam, England, Holland, I see. Some nations are crying, oh me, to follow God. They say a heads up to some that did not turn away. Behold, the judge comes, and who in hell can stand? None, says the Lord, not even those in this land. Those who have opposed me, let it be said and heard this day, that men like Buddha judge tried to teach the people that I am gay. You have kept my evangelist captive for too long. Therefore, says the Lord, I sent to my prophet to pen this song. And it dawned on me, this was a song. That's why he titled it, Behold the Judge Comes. A shaking at CERN now will shake, and it will take them years to rebuild that place. Have you ever heard Jezebel scream as she was thrown off the wall? Anticipation of the ground and the fall. I heard the growl of dogs as they growl. I heard the sound in t anticipating Jezebel's fall. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Deliverance for one and all in the fall, says the Lamb. The warrior's song of praise, a song for the last days. What last days? The last days of tyranny. There is no laughter on a deathbed. We're coming for you was uttered. Enough said. Behold, the judge comes to right every wrong. Behold, the judge comes. So sing this song. Behold, the judge comes, make straight his path. Oh, cry, oh, cry, my people, the time has come at last. Behold, the judge comes, hello to the world. Behold, the judge comes. Now, that was, a, that was something the Lord had given me, and I had pinned this down, and this was absolutely it was completely different to me, but it was a prophetic song. And I watched that and I listened to that. And I, I mean, I'm watching as, as, as seeing things and all that. Now, so times are changing fast in this prophetic scheme. Everything's shaping up for the last. But now I want to show you something about the last times. See, this is not the end of time. It's the end times. And so there's something in the last days. See, we're, we're fighting a nation. Uh, I mean, in a nations, in the nations, we're fighting this tyranny that's trying to come in. And it's the Antichrist trying to push his regime into the nations before it's time. And it's not time yet. Now, I want to show you some things that's, that's very, very powerful here. The Lord said to teach this, and it's how to live in these last days. It's how to prosper in these last days, and it's things that you can do that depends on no governments. It depends on no matter what they rule, no matter what they say, it makes no difference at all to this way. Hallelujah. God has given us a way to prosper, a way to succeed, a way to bring us an expected end. Now, I want you to, um, I want you to hear this. See, every believer has the ability to, we're in God's image, in his likeness. So every, everybody has the ability to express God and to reveal God. Uh, this is an exciting thing to be able to express God and to reveal God. Now, you see, you were created. Well, I should say this. You were born into a world 
that you were not created to live in. Now, see, you were born into this world, this fallen world. This is the world after Adam fell. Before Adam fell, it was a completely different looking place than you live in right now. So you were born into a fallen world. So you were born into a world you were not created to live in. So you wasn't born into a natural world. You were born into a subnatural world, below natural. And so what you need, and see, and here is the thing. It's just like when, when Jesus was spoke to the storm and the master spoke to the winds and waves and said, peace, be still. He released his word, which is a supernatural. So he took, and supernatural means out of natural. Subnatural is below natural. The actual natural world is what Adam lived in before he sinned. So when this storm kicked up and tried to stop the will of God, and every storm is to try to stop the will of God. And when this storm kicked up trying to stop the will of God, Jesus released the out of natural, the supernatural word of God. It reached into the subnatural, which was the storm, and pulled it up to the natural. And there was a great calm. There was such a calm that the scripture says it scared the disciples more than the storm scared the disciples. They were, people have grown used to living in a subnatural world. And so a lot of people, when you start teaching about the absolute goodness of God and how good God is and the power of God and the supernatural, um, putting things right again, you know, the Lord had given me a word. He said that I, he talking about himself. He said, I'm the perfect. And he said, you're the imperfect. He said, I give you a voice into the perfect and you give me a voice into the imperfect. And he said, so when you speak into the perfect, I can send the perfect into the imperfect and pull the imperfect back up and make it perfect. And we call that a miracle. So uh, when people start hearing these things, and they teach so much. You've got to go through a storm. You must go through this storm. God has got me in a storm and this and that. It's because when things are righted to its rightful place, it scares them more than the storm scared them. Because they're so used to rowing against a storm. They're so used to fighting against a storm and saying, I'm so battle weary. I'm so beat down. I'm this and I'm so fatigued. I'm so tired. But they're used to it. And if you start talking about how we can pull this up to a natural state to live in it the way Adam saw it, it scares them. And so they fight against that. Oh, no, no. You must suffer. You have to suffer. But that's not the will of God that you suffer. Jesus suffered for you, so you didn't have to do that. So we have to release his word, the supernatural, into the subnatural, use our faith and pull it up to its natural state the way it should be. Hallelujah. And the scripture talks about in James, it says, if any man's tempted, tested, or tried, don't let him say God did that. For God can't be tempted, tested, or tried with evil, and neither will he tempt, test, or try any man. And what does evil mean? Anything that's not as it should be. See, that's subnatural. Pull it up to natural, it becomes a, a peace and a calm and the state God meant it to be in. And that scares a lot of people. Who does it scare? Not the world. Not the world. It scares disciples. It scares disciples. See, that's just like the world feeds and runs off of, off of uh, the love of money. The, not money, the love of it. Because money is the thread that touches everything in your life. See, you can't do anything without money. You can't do anything without it. You can't eat without it. You can't drive without it. You can't have electricity without it. I can't do this broadcast without it. Everything, your clothes, your food, everything, money touched it somewhere. So that's the thread 
that runs through the fabric of your natural existence. So if, if you can let God touch the end of that thread, then the devourer has to turn the rest of it loose. And whatever was subnatural then can be rebuked and pulled up to a natural state. But this scares people, not just people. The money, uh, uh, the world loves money. It loves to prosper. It don't have any, it don't have any qualms at all about living in a, in a uh, high dollar expensive house. It don't have any qualms at all about flying the best planes, driving the best cars. It likes to get on yachts and party until everybody's so drunk they fall overboard. It loves to go into the extravagant and build things that are useless to anyone else. And just to have, there's people with, that they, they have money to the point, I mean, the world does now, to where they don't wear prescription glasses, some of them, when they drive, they have prescription windshields. Just think of that. And so you've got all of this going on. It don't scare the world to prosper. It scares disciples to prosper because they're so used to battling the subnatural and living in it. If they ever see the natural, it scares them. It scares them. Now, the reason I'm talking about this today, for two days, God has spoken to me about this. I was doing a stream uh, in India. I was uh, with a man in India, and I was talking about it, and he began to ask me questions. And and they, he likes to ask me questions, and it's a, a powerful program. And uh, he said, what about the wealth transfer? What about uh, all of this? And how does that happen? And so on and so forth. And so I didn't really, wasn't expecting the question. And so the Lord had me start talking about it. And then on the Church International uh, stream Sunday, this past Sunday, Krista was teaching over the offering. And the Lord showed me a whole revelation about the tithe. And he said, come on here today and share this with the 11th hour family. Because the way governments are right now, have you not noticed that, that there's so much blessing in the earth that they're having to create shortages? They're having to create them and they're having a hard time at it. Because about the time they rip one plant up, three replaces it. I mean, God has his hand on everything right now, and it's just flourishing, flourishing. And they can't make a legitimate shortage. They just can't seem to do that. So he began to talk to me about this, and he wanted me to tell you that no matter what the governments do, no matter what anyone else does, he has given you and me a way to come up out of the subnatural and live in the natural. Hallelujah. Now, how do you do that? Well, the Lord gave, the Lord told Adam in the very beginning. He said, in Genesis 2, he said, "All see these trees? He said, all these trees will produce for you freely. He said, you have to give me that tree. Talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so the tree of the knowledge of good and, of good and evil became his tithe tree. As long as he gave God that one, all the rest of them produced freely for him. And notice there was no intruder in his garden. Nothing. As long as he gave him the tithe off of all the other trees. Now, we see that after that, we see Abel tithing. He went to the altar of sacrifice and he brought of the firstlings of his flock, the tithe and the fat thereof and offered it. And the Lord had respect to his offering. Now, you just keep coming ahead. And, and when you start to go through this, you find out that Noah was a tither. So how do we know Noah was a tither? Well, Malachi 3 declares 
that when you bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven. Now, here are these mysteries hidden in this, because we're about to jump on something deep here. I will open you the windows of heaven. What opened them? The tithe. Now, what is a tithe? Well, a tithe means tenth. It means if you have a dime, then God should get a penny of that. If you have a dollar, he should get a dime of that. Whatever is the tenth. That way it's available for everyone to have the windows of heaven open to them. No matter how, what your income is, no matter what it is, it's not an amount, it's a percentage. And he said, if you let me touch the end of that thread by giving me a tithe of it, he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. I will do these things. I will open the windows of heaven. All nations, all nationalities, all ethnicities, everything will, and everyone will call you blessed because it opens the windows of heaven and the blessing of the Lord comes into the earth on your life. Now, what is the blessing of the Lord? It's the highest empowerment that heaven can give to a man. It's the empowerment of God, of heaven, to do anything, to accomplish anything. And since we know it was the tide that opens the windows of heaven, now you know why the windows opened over Noah's ark and it was the blessing of the Lord that came out of those windows and caused that boat, that, that wooden aircraft carrier sized boat to withstand all the great flood that hit the earth. It was the tithe that did that. How do you know Noah was a tither? We see that when the boat landed, he offered the sacrifice, the first thing off the boat. He gave a sacrifice. He was a tither. He was a tither. He knew what opened the windows of heaven. Adam taught them that. Abel knew that. Noah learned that. It's the thing that opens the windows of heaven. Now, why? Because there has to be a way. See, the man's spirit was created perfect. His body's created perfect. But the, they're on two different levels. So there had to be something from heaven come into the earth to connect God to the natural realm around you, the created realm around you, in order for your body to live fit enough, well enough, whole enough, complete enough that your spirit could have full expression through it in the earth and bring about the will of God. Man, that's powerful. You know that? That's powerful. No wonder God, and when God created the, the spirit, then he made the body and spread himself on the body and inhaled, caught up the man's spirit in his breath, breathed it into the nostrils of the body, and the man's soul became alive with the knowledge of how to bring heaven to the earth. It was amazing of how to live the way God's vision and God uh, saw the man living, his own family. Hallelujah. Now, so you start seeing this tithe thing. We see it in the time when Elisha, you know, in the, there was a famine in the land. And the king came or sent his, his, and sent his captain with him. And they banged on the door. And Elisha had the prophets hold the door shut. That's prophetic within itself. The kings are banging on the door. They're trying to use all of their strength, their might, their military, whatever it may be. Because the only strength of, of, of a dictator is military. If the military has a revival, the dictator loses its strength. Man, I grew up with people in the country. I knew some girls that would have whipped Hitler, would have beat his brains out, man, with their bare hands. I mean, he wasn't no match for some of these people I knew growing up. I mean, really, the only strength he had was the military. Strip him of that and he just, he just disappeared. Well, there's a revival in the military going on in this nation. 
And there's a revival in the military around the world right now. Don't you even kid yourself. It's happening. If anybody loves God and wants to pursue God, it's soldiers. Hallelujah. Because they live on the verge of life and death all the time. They know what they want to know God and have him with them the way David did. Any soldiers watching, look at Psalm 91. That is the soldier's psalm to keep you and protect you and hold you. Hallelujah. Lord, I plead the blood over our soldiers and soldiers around the world that love you and look for you and pursue you, that they'll be protected in every way with the power of the 91st Psalm. Now, so when that king came and he was beating on the door, the prophets held the door shut so he could do no harm. That's prophetic. All you prophets, listen. And so when they talked back and forth through that door, Elisha said, tomorrow about this time, there'll be such an abundance in the city, in the gate of the city, it'll be sold for just nothing hardly. And that captain on whose hand the king leaned said, if the windows of heaven were opened, might this thing be? In other words, now that's the same word windows that was over Noah's ark. And it's the same word windows that's over the tithe. And that's about the only times it's talked about. So we know that this is tied to the tithe because the windows are mentioned. Sure enough, the prophetic word that Elisha gave happened when that in, in the twilight that there were four lepers and lepers rep, uh, leprosy represents sin. They were sitting outside the gate of Samaria and suddenly the, they had this thought, said there's death in the city. If we go in the city, we'll die. We got leprosy. We're going to die anyway. We're over at the Syrians camp where they besieged the city and caused this great famine. They're, they're, there's death over there. But since we're going to die anyway, let's just get up and go to the Syrians. Maybe they'll have mercy on us and feed us. If they don't, they just kill us, which is no big deal because they said we're going to die anyway. So they rose up in the twilight and the scripture said when they rose up in the twilight, that the Syrians heard a sound. The Assyrians heard a sound, and they rose up in the twilight, and they run, ran and left all their goods, gold, silver, raiment, food. There was so much. There was an abundance. The windows opened because Elisha was a tither. A tither. And he knew the secret of opening the windows. And when those windows opened, here came the abundance. Sure enough, the next day, and the Lord used sinners to get it. Whoa, the transfer is now being alluded to here. And so the next day, there was so much food in the gate of the city that the captain who mocked it that Elisha had told him the day before. He said, because of that, when the captain said, if the windows of heaven were open, might this thing be? He said, you'll see it, but you'll never partake of it. The next day when the abundance showed up, the people got so excited, so hungry. They wanted it so bad, so, so much food. They trampled that captain to death. He saw it, but he never got to partake of it. Don't you see what's happening? We're in a siege. We're in a siege war. Tyrants always uh, fight with a siege war. Right now, the jackal that's sitting in the White House and all of his people, which the Democrat Party in this nation is actually the spirit of Og, the giant. And that's who we're in battle with right now is Og, the spirit of Og. And it's and those They've got the ships blockaded off the coast of California and so forth, stacked full of food and all that, trying to siege the nation to create a, sor a shortage around the world big enough that we just give up. 
Oh, but they don't understand something. There are tithers among the body of Christ. There are people tithing, and we're calling for the windows of heaven to open. And abundance is pouring out, and they cannot make the shortage happen, my brother and sister. They're trying, but they can't make it happen. Nobody can stop the windows of heaven from opening once a tither opens it. And they are the devourer. And God said, the Lord said, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Who? The tither. Not for the rest of its sake. Now, wait a minute. Whoa. Man, this is getting big. So we know Abraham tithed. Because Abraham, you know, when he went to the slaughter of the king, and he, uh, the slaughter of the kings happened. That Abraham slaughtered all those four kings and their armies that came, which had giants in them and everything else, uh, and they've slaughtered them and uh, are armies that giants couldn't beat. Abraham beat them all with his tra- three hundred and twenty of his train, or eighteen of his trained servants, and and uh, Mamre and his brothers. He just beat them all surrounded them. How about that? And just beat them all. When he came back, Melchizedek, which was Noah's son, Shem, approached Abraham and offered him the articles of the covenant, the bread and the wine. And it said, Abraham gave him tithes of all. Listen what Melchizedek told him. He said, blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. Abram had opened the windows with his tithe. He was absolutely, and that day it was so powerful. He gave him tithes of all that Abram became a, he got the title deed to a piece of heaven called paradise. That's why it's called Abraham's bosom. And he opened the windows and tied the blessing that God had promised him in Genesis 12, tied it to the earth. And he said, I won't take, he told the king of Sodom, I won't take anything from you, even to a shoelace, lest any man say he made Abram rich, but I've raised my hand to the most high God. He did it through his tithe. They all knew this mystery. Well, why does the body of Christ fight so hard over tithing? You may tell you why. I'll tell you why. It's because they're scared of the natural. They've grown so used to living in the subnatural that if you tithe, the blessing comes down, pulls the subnatural up to the natural, and then it's called the supernatural, pulling it up to the natural, the natural state that Adam lived in, and it scares disciples. The calm in their lives scares them more than the the storm. And they think everything's going so well, it can't be something bad is about to happen. It scares them. They just rather fight through the storm. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. And I want to tell my 11th hour partner something. The tithe is not an evil statement. I remember 25, 30 years ago, the statistic was that 18% of the body of Christ tithe. That was 18 out of 100, 25, 30 years ago. Now, the statistic is four out of 100 tithe. What is the enemy so scared of the tithe about? Because he knows it will open the windows of heaven. It destroyed the giants in the days of Noah. It erased everything the enemy was trying to do to destroy mankind. And those of you that study the Nephilim and all of that know it was the flood that did it. And it was the tide that opened those windows. It's all connected to this. So the body of Christ has got to learn a mystery. And it's a mystery that I I want to make it deeper right here. I hope you got your shouting shoes on, man. If you don't, shout in the ones you got until you get where you can put them on. Hallelujah. Okay, you ready? All right, Lord, show us this thing. And show us this thing, Lord, the way you want us to see it. It's amazing here. The tithe is even.